Hello, everyone, and welcome for and welcome to today's webcast. My name is Amy Brown, and I'm the director of events and education for Trade Press Media Group, which includes building operating management and facility maintenance decision magazines. Today's webcast is COVID return to work planning, airflow testing, spatial mapping, and surface testing. Our presenters today are Shirley Thomas and Sid Likes. Sid has spent 20 years managing facilities before joining OpenWorks in 2018 as Regional Operations Manager. Sid is responsible for all aspects of operations and works with the district's managers to ensure quality control and adherence to OpenWorks standards. Shirley has over 25 years of safety and health and environmental experience within manufacturing, construction, hospitality, aerospace industries, and her experience includes safety management systems, industrial hygiene, and compliance management. Today's webcast learning objectives include a discussion on why airflow qualities and quantities are important. Learn how role spatial mapping plays into your return to work program. Review how airflow impacts spatial mapping and discuss why testing surfaces for COVID-19 and other viruses is important. All great conversation topics for today. But before we get started with the content, I'd like to go over just a few details with you. A live question and answer session will follow today's presentation. To submit your questions, please navigate to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type in your question. You might have to just hover over the bottom of your screen for that Q&A panel to, to uh, become visible. Our presenters will answer as many questions as time permits. Today's event will also include some multiple choice polling questions. We'll give you instructions when those come up during the presentation, but we do ask that you participate as your input is greatly appreciated. At the conclusion of today's webcast, you'll receive a PDF copy of the slides. You'll also receive a link to a brief online assessment. And upon completion, successful completion of the assessment, you'll receive a CEU certification. Today's webcast will also be archived at facilitiesnet.com slash webcast. Now, I'd like to turn it over to Shirley, who will tell you more about what we've built, we will be discussing today. Shirley? Well, I thank so much, Amy, for that introduction. I appreciate that. It's my pleasure to be here. Today, we will discuss employee and organizational expectations and responsibilities in a post-COVID world. Um, during our presentation, we will discuss the importance of maintaining um, or having a return to work plan, which should include maintaining good air quality, your plan should include social distancing, spatial mapping, and also cleaning and disinfecting protocols. Um, you should have a maintenance plan as well, and we'll get into the nuts and bolts of that plan later in the, later in the presentation. Um, we will then follow up with information on our companies, Yellowbird and OpenWorks, and um, end with a Q&A. Next slide, please. Okay, so before we get into the plan, um, I would like to proceed um, with doing a question. Um, I would like to take a moment uh, for you to answer a question um, concerning COVID. So do you have a current COVID return to work plan? So you can let me know by participating in our poll. Should be up there. Yes, and surely there should be a box that popped up in your window, so feel free just to answer based on the correct response you would like to give. We'll give it a, just a few minutes. Absolutely. Looks like we've got about 70, 5% of the audience has participated. We'll give it just another few seconds here. All right, we'll end the poll and get that over to you. Okay. 
Are you able to see the results on the screen, Shirley? I can see the results, so you'll have to Perfect. go with me. Oh, sorry. Uh, so we currently have 82% uh, of the audience, or 119 people said yes, they do, and 18% uh, said no, they do not. So 27 people have said no, they do not. Okay, well, well, whether you have a plan in place or you're in the process of developing your plan, we hope that this presentation will give you some key elements and just some insight on your COVID return to work plan. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's talk about the plan itself. Um, with your plan, uh, it's good to start your plan with actually an assessment. So you're going to assess your workplace for the elements that's going to go into your plan. Um, assessing your jobs that may be of high risk for your employees. And these jobs may be employees that come in contact with a lot of people, a lot of clients, a lot of visitors. So you want to ask yourself with these employees, uh, what type of hazards are they in associated with the exposure to COVID? So you want to ask yourself within your plan, are these employees in close quarters? What can we do about spacing? Uh, the purpose of your assessment is to reveal the sources that are likely to expose your employees. Next slide, please. Communication, very, very important with your plan. Um, just to speak on a little bit more about the details of your plan as well. Um, social distance, distancing is gonna be part of your plan. Mapping is gonna be part of your plan. Um, your plan should include such, uh, such things as hygiene, which is hand washing, uh, the protocol for providing hand sanitizers, educating your workforce on actually washing their hands, et cetera. Um, your cleaning and disinfecting protocol is gonna be a vital part as well. Another vital part is communication. With communication uh, being the forefront of how you are going to let your employees know their responsibilities and what your responsibilities are as a employee, employer to keep the workplace at a safe environment. So finally, your plan um, should be, what are the responsibilities of your company as far as what you do for your employees, the communication you give to your employees? Unfortunately, um, at this time, OSHA has started to uh, receive inquiries and um, assess the workplace with, um, with uh, actions taken from employees that are uh, giving them information on not having a plan in place and giving OSHA information about um, just not having the communication that they need. So it's a precursor, unfortunately, for your employees for to their perception is very important. So you're gonna to want to have all your ducks in a row when it comes to your communication to your employees. Okay, next slide. Okay, so we are going to, at this moment, um, we are going to talk about um, air quality. But before we get into um, the air quality. I think this is a poll that I want to take. And we're going to ask, um, does your COVID return to work plan include HVAC testing? So Amy, you can start the poll. Yes, it's popped up on people's screen. So we'll give you a few seconds here to respond to it. Again, it's uh, the question on the screen is, does your COVID return to work plan include HVAC testing? Two options today, just a simple yes or no.
got major majority of the audience in. We'll just give it another second here to get anybody that still needs to participate. And and share the results with you, Shirley. Okay, I can see the results. And the results state that 45% says yes, um, they do test HVAC system, and 55% said no. Okay, so as we know, COVID typically spreads through respiratory droplets, um, from coughing, sneezing, talking, and just being in close proximity with a person that's infected. The spread becomes higher and the risk becomes higher when inside opposed to outdoor spaces. This means that maintaining your HVAC system is very, very important. Next slide, please. We're gonna talk about air quality for a moment. So managing good air quality can be complex with many different variables there. So ask any of your maintenance facilities employees and they'll tell you that maintaining good air quality sometimes is not as easy as what we may think it is. Um, it entails very much variables that are working behind the scenes that we do not see as the regular people not addressing or having responsibility of the um, HVAC system. So your HVAC system and keeping it in good maintenance um, is the first line of defense for providing good air quality. In a post-COVID world, the HVAC system may need to be reassessed and it may be reassessed or the need to reassess your HVAC system may come in the form of your air changes per hour, um, testing the air changes and how that correlates to the manufacturer's instructions. It may be upgrading totally your HVAC system um, in this post-COVID world we live in. In addition to that, you can increase or you may have the capability to increase your airflow changes or you may be required or be required to increase the filter efficiency um, of your HVA system. But no matter what changes you make to your uh, air quality and your HVAC system within this post COVID world that we live in now, um, we must be cognizant of the manufacturer's uh, responsibilities and what the manufacturer says the capability of your HVAC system is. Um, unfortunately, sometimes we want to take our workplaces and um, demand that the HVAC system be at a hospital level, um, but that is not a necessary function uh, sometimes of our workplaces uh, because our workplaces are not hospitals. So we want to make sure that we get a clear um, cut understanding of what the manufacturers are telling us that the work uh, flow of our HVAC systems are. Next slide. A vital part of assessing how well the HVAC system is, is to perform and do air quality checks, um, periodic air quality checks. Um, you're checking the airflow. You may want to check the carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide levels, and checking the air changes to see how efficient you are uh, running your HVAC system. Um, with that, the humidity levels as well, um, all of these things can tell us how well our HVAC system is working. So if these levels are out of whack, if it's too much humidity in the room, um, if the airflow is just not uh, testing at the manufacturer's uh, rate, well then that could be a precursor for our HVAC, HVAC systems to actually not be working properly. So we wanna do those checks and make sure those checks are in place. Next slide, please. So one element of your plan should be spatial mapping. Initially, spatial mapping, just to give you a little bit of information about the history of it, was very important to hospitals and medical facilities. 
And spatial mapping is actually very, very mathematical and is very scientific. Um, and these equations were used in hospitals to basically uh, let the hospital population um, know how many people could be in a room with a certain type of illness, et cetera. So it's very, um, very technical and scientific. However, next slide. Spatial mapping as we know, and as we work in our workplaces are a little bit different from initially the scientific data that's put out there by the hospitals and why hospitals need that. So our spatial mapping within our workplaces is gonna look a little bit differently, but the guidelines set by the CDC and the importance of the end means for why you need to space to spatial map and plan that out is very important for us in our workplaces. Components of our spatial planning and mapping is going to be limiting the number of people in a place or in a room or in an office. If you can stagger shifts or have people work from home, the more that you can do to limit uh, the employees within a opens within a space within inside of the facility is going to be best. So you wanna review how your facility is set up. You wanna review how your workplace is set up so that you can make those modifications and if modifications can be made. Within the spatial mapping, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you have things that are in place such as um, the social distancing, which is that six foot requirement um, for people to be distancing from each other. You wanna make sure that you define areas that are off limits uh, within your workplace. And you wanna make sure that the flow of your traffic um, is adhering to a spatial mapping plan. And what that means is, with a, within a post-COVID world, we may have to have one way into a facility and one way out, which means that um, the traffic flow of the way that people will enter and exit our facilities will be a little bit different um, post-COVID. Next slide. PPE is essential. Um, as we know, PPE is just essential for us working in our daily lives and more important in some of the higher risk uh, categories of work. Assessing PPE for employers is a necessity. We must provide that PPE that the employee needs. In a post-COVID, um, as relating to COVID, the PPE, your general basic PPE is going to be uh, your face coverings, and uh, they can come in the form of a respirator, um, a dust mask, or any type of face covering. In addition to gloves and hand sanitizers, those are personal protective equipment post-COVID related directly to COVID. However, depending upon the task of your employees, uh, you may have to have additional PPE that may be required due to COVID, and that may be Tyvek suits. You uh, may have someone in the cleaning department and post-COVID they will have to wear some type of Tyvek suit or some extra coveralls or um, in addition to that, depends on the uh, chemicals that they may be cleaning with. They may need um, a, a respirator now that they didn't need before. So PPE is definitely important an important aspect of uh, your plan that you're gonna have. Next slide, please. An important aspect of returning to work from COVID is addressing how our organizations uh, will interact with our customers and visitors. As we know, our visitors and customers to our business is vital. However, during a post-COVID um, work environment, uh, we may want to limit visitor accessibility into our facilities. Uh, we want to make sure that we track our visitors, um, make sure we know when they're there, make sure that they're accounted for when they're there, um, ensure that our 
visitors and our vendors that come to our sites ensure that the proper PPE um, is worn by them as well as our employees. In a post-COVID um, world, we see that uh, sometimes, um, for instance, I, I went to a grocery store yesterday and we have to have a uh, mask here where I live. And with that, um, there were some people that didn't have them and the grocery store provided the mask for them. They provided face coverings. Um, it, there's no difference in that than our workplaces. So if our visitors come and do not have a face mask um, or a face covering, uh, it's our duty to, to have that face covering for them there. In addition to the elements that were just discussed about our visitors, it's very important to follow government guidelines as well. Now with our government guidelines, we want to make sure um, that not only CDC and a government level, but there's state requirements and county requirements, et cetera. And with that, um, some organizations actually have temperature checks um, as their screening process. Um, your plan actually must have a stay-at-home communication element of that plan. Um, your employees must be taught their responsibility when it comes to if they feel sick, what should they do, who should they report that to. Uh, so those elements are very important and part of that communication process for your employees. Engineering controls. So engineering controls are physical modifications to a process that decrease or eliminate the risk for the employees. Next slide. Now with your engineering controls, things that reduce the hazards or reduce the risk, some engineering controls can actually engineer out the hazard totally. Um, however, some of these engineering controls may consist of physical barriers. Um, we have physical barriers in the workplace now that we didn't have before, and they, they could be examples such as a plexiglass um, in front of a receptionist's office, or it could be uh, some type of cautioning off for the flow of traffic. So physical barriers is one of those uh, engineering controls that that we see now um, post-COVID that we didn't see before. Another is um, air filters and just our uh, HVAC system itself. So how often are we um, changing our air filters? We may be required in this post-COVID um, world to look at our filters and change them more often, um, change them more often than what the manufacturer has stated. Uh, the duration of our maintenance schedules um, may, may increase. We may have, um, previously we may have had a quarterly um, maintenance schedule. Uh, Post-COVID, we may have a 60-day schedule. So the duration of that uh, maintenance and the maintenance of um, your system may be increased due to COVID. Um, in addition to spatial mapping, of course, uh, we have the social distancing. Um, these are just elements that are part of implementing engineered controls. Next slide, please. Surface testing. Um, surface testing can be an added value for your COVID plan, uh, which may increase employee positive perceptions in the workplace. Um, OSHA's number one uh, complaint uh, currently right now is from employees and their lack of understanding of what has been put in place. Now with your surface testing, um, you're gonna want to make sure that you test in conspicuous places. You want to make sure that your surface testing is a test resembling places that are highly traveled in your workplace. This could be restrooms, um, door handles, um, any place that's uh, a conference area where people gather. These are the places that you will uh, want to do that surface testing. If you decide to do surface testing, those are the places that you want to do that. 
Your surface testing actually must be sent to a credible laboratory as well. And those laboratories are um, designed or recommended by the CDC. Next slide, please. And this slide here, we're going to talk a little bit about cleaning and disinfecting. Um, however, uh, we will have Sid actually come on and he is going to, uh, Sid Likes is going to um, tell us a little bit more detail about um, how important cleaning and disinfecting and having a um, having a plan of action for our maintenance. So Sid uh, Likes, do you wanna take it over from here? Got it, thank you, Shirley. Um, okay, everyone, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, so let's talk a little bit about reevaluating your cleaning and disinfecting requirements. So uh, we have a slide here. Our company commissioned a survey back in April that basically wanted to um, assess uh, the importance of change in frequency and cleaning post-COVID-19 in the, in the new environment that we're in. So if you take a look at this slide real quick, quick it's real interesting that uh, we have 53% of people surveyed said that uh, they were um, most likely they were going to increase the frequency of their cleaning and disinfecting. So that's not really a shocker um, given uh, the current environment. Uh, I will call to attention that bottom 3% down there, those people who said they were unlikely or probably wouldn't do anything. That's probably a place I wouldn't want to frequent or, or dine at or, or, or go to. Um, so um, we, the CDC recommends that, um, that you uh, increase the amount of disinfecting and frequency in your facility uh, to ensure the, um, the uh, mitigation of any viruses, bacteria, germs uh, that may be present in that environment. Um, and so with that being said, you're gonna want to consider updating your cleaning and disinfecting requirements in your facility and, and you know, to the routine that you desire. You're gonna want to pay attention to uh, high touch areas in your place. And so I'm gonna kind of talk about that. That's a, it, it's a, a, an odd, um, a term that we use now, high touch. So, and and in people that I talk with in day to day, you would be surprised how shocked they are to hear that some of these things are high touch. They never even think about it in normal cleaning. So, uh, we're talking about doorknobs, we're talking about coffee machines, printers, cabinets, chair arms, desks, countertops, uh, entry hallways, um, uh, stairwells, the rails and the stairwells. These are things that are touched every day by hundreds of people, and we never really think about. Uh, making sure that they're clean. Wheelchairs, if you have a, you know, a wheelchair that you provide to your patrons, those need to be disinfected regularly. Um, keyboards, mouses, and any public use area. Remote controls. Uh, vending machines, uh, you know, vending machines, those are out of sight, out of mind. People don't think about that. Um, elevator buttons, public phone, sinks, faucets. Um, let's see, food preparation services, that's kind of a no-brainer. Uh, and then break rooms, uh, any place where your uh, employee base will congregate, microwaves, refrigerators, kitchen appliances, things like that. You really need to think about how frequently you are disinfecting those areas. Um, so uh, an another um, important part of cleaning and disinfecting is you need to choose, uh, next slide, you need to choose a professional cleaning service um, that uh, that is, you know, capable of handling your needs. And there's certain requirements that that you want to make sure that they are, uh, you know, prepared and 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 ready to handle for you. So I'm going to go over a couple of those real quick for you. So the first one is reputation. So you want to make sure you're partnering with a company that you know has a good reputation in the uh, the cleaning industry. Um, that they are, um, you know, uh, they're, they're trustworthy because let's face it, you're, you're leaving them unsupervised within your environment. You're trusting them with your business asset while you're not there. So you want to make sure that they treat your asset as if they treat their own. So they're, they're locking doors behind them. They're, they're making sure that the property that they're, that they're around is secured and, and, you know, that they're not, you can trust them within your environment. So reputation, very important. Um, Second, uh, you want to make sure that they are um, well 
versed in cleaning and disinfecting procedures. So uh, a way to do that is to ask them if they use EP and list and approved disinfectants. Um, you'd be surprised how many cleaning companies post COVID-19, I'm gonna say post COVID-19, had no idea what that meant. They didn't know anything about, you know, EPA approved disinfectants. You know, they, they thought that, hey, I, I use Fabulosa, I use Pine Sol, that's pretty good, right? Smells great. Um, no, no more. Those days are gone, guys. Um, you want to make sure that they understand the cleaning process and that they use these disinfectants. They use a disinfectant that's approved by the CDC to eliminate germs and bacteria. Um, it, it's got to eliminate 99.9% of bacteria and viruses. Um, and that also includes um, bacteria or viruses that are resistant to disinfectants as well. So it has to be a disinfectant that can actually cope with that, like MRSA. Um, so you wanna make sure that, that they're using chemicals that are capable of handling that. And a good way, I, mean, I, I would refer you guys to, to go to the CDC, uh, Reopening American Guidance, um, they will give you a link to the uh, list in approved disinfectants and you can kind of take a look, you can see what's on there. So whenever you're working with a cleaning company, ask them what they use and then go to that website and check it and make sure that, that uh, it is list in approved. Um, so something else that would be uh, definitely to your benefit to make sure that your cleaning company is, um, is uh, well versed in is Training and certificates. You want to make sure that they are, um, you know, trained in uh, bio uh, or bloodborne pathogen certificates. You want to make sure that they have a global bio advisory council uh, certificate that they are they are trained and understand how to clean uh, and how to disinfect for um, for viruses. You want to make sure that they uh, make sure that every cleaner that they have on site. Has a, has a certificate and is trained and is well versed. Um, so that's not a question that's beyond the realm of possibility to ask your cleaning company. Uh, something else you want to make sure that they have uh, experience in the industry. That's a no brainer, right? Um, so depending upon what your particular needs are, you know, uh, if it's you know goes beyond the scope of just an office or a bank, you want to make sure that they are well versed in cleaning in that environment. If it's if it's a lab or if it's a, a hospital or um, let's say it's a production facility that has its own amount of challenges. You want to make sure they have experience cleaning in those environments. Uh, and then uh, lastly, communication. You want to make sure that the company that you partner with um, are good communicators, that they use logbooks, that they actually reach out to you and, 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 and make sure that, uh, that, uh, that the service they're providing is meeting your needs. That, and also, let's say something goes wrong, you want to make sure that they have the ability or they have an internal process for you to get a hold of someone after hours. Um, most of the cleaning goes on after hours and, and there might be an emergency, if there might be an issue. You might need to reach out to someone. Well, you know, there's nothing worse than having an emergency and getting, you know, we'll be with you, uh, you know, at seven o'clock in the morning. Okay, well, that's not really gonna help you at that particular time. So you wanna make sure that they have a plan in place that addresses after hour issues and that you can get quick and immediate responses to, to uh, anything that should arise. Um, so with that being said, let's talk a little bit about the process here, uh, cleaning and disinfecting, uh, and deep cleaning. So, um, this is, this is extremely important. Um, there is a difference in cleaning and disinfecting. And so after dealing with COVID-19 for the last few months, uh, me personally, um, I, I can't stress enough to, to, to customers and, and the employees that I come in contact with the difference in making sure that others understand that difference. So I'm just gonna cover that real quick. So cleaning is the physical removal of dirt and debris um, on a surface in an environment. So that's basically uh, sweeping, it's mopping, it's wiping a surface down, it's just removing the dirt, the debris, okay? Once you've cleaned something, that doesn't necessarily mean it's disinfected, okay? I mean, you can clean something with soap and water. That doesn't necessarily disinfect it. Disinfecting means that you have removed 99.999% of all the bacteria and viruses on that surface. So that's the second step. Um, you cannot disinfect something without first cleaning it. Um, if you disinfect something and you haven't cleaned it, all you've done is disinfected the dirt. Um, so that's 
probably not a clean environment because as soon as the dirt gets disturbed, the surface underneath that dirt is not disinfected. So you want to make sure that your cleaning company understands that. That's just that's that's just extremely important. I can't stress that enough. Um, so next slide. And this slide talks a little bit about um, you know we had a survey uh, we wanted to, to kind of gauge and understand the importance uh, from our customers the importance of visuals of disinfecting in their facilities. So. Um, just real quick, I wanted to kind of talk about that. So if you see here, you've got, we've had 88% of people that were surveyed here um, place a huge importance on training for their employees. They want to make sure that their employees are trained because let's face it, the, a healthy and safe environment starts on the individual level. It's the practices, it's the knowledge, it's, the, um, it, it's how we conduct ourselves as individuals within an environment. Uh, on a day-to-day -day basis that, that basically kind of sets the tone of how healthy and safe the environment is. So 88% of the people we polled place a lot of emphasis on training and making sure that the employee understands what's expected and, and, and how to do their part. So that being said, 72% of the people polled uh, placed a huge importance on signage, making sure that they uh, were calling out certain areas and, and calling out um, uh, protocols and, and placing signs in and just uh, using constant reminders and also letting people know that things have been disinfected. That if you know a surface has actually been disinfected, actually placing a sign and letting people know that this area right here has been disinfected at you know at, at this time or, or this day or it's been done. Uh, and then we have 66% or 66.5% of employees of, of, of people who said that they want to make sure that they uh, that there's a visual that the the customer sees the employee or the cleaning uh, company actually cleaning because that gives a great impression that this is actually being done. There's nothing that's more reassuring to you that cleaning's being done than actually seeing someone actually cleaning. That that kind of takes away the doubt, 100%. Um, so with that being said, uh, I'm gonna transition it back to Shirley and let Shirley talk a little about about maintenance plan, and then we're going to get into some Q and A. Okay, well, thanks again. And your, your maintenance plan, uh, we are speaking on the maintenance plan of your HVAC system, HVAC system. And with that maintenance, um, you want to make sure that number one, uh, your HVAC system is working at the um, increments of what the manufacturer um, has stated it should be. Uh, with your maintenance plan, uh, you may have to uh, incorporate, again, um, new changes as far as what you do with your maintenance plan, as far as the cleaning schedule of your, your coils, your changing schedule of your filtration system, your filter system. And um, in addition to just maintaining uh, your your maintenance plan, you're gonna to wanna to review that plan. Um, is your maintenance facility, is your maintenance plan, your HVAC system, uh, is it, um, has your building changed? Um, do you need to upgrade your system? So these are things that within this post COVID, uh, we are looking at and addressing and assessing to ensure that these particular things are working um, and in place and in plan. Next slide. Now with your uh, plan for uh, post-COVID, um, you're required to have some type of notification of how you plan to shut down if um, you would need to shut down your facility. These particular shutdown um, plans have a very big component of local entities, local federal, local guidelines, local municipality guidelines. Um, so one state may be open, another may not. Uh, as we have seen throughout this COVID, um, not every state is the same. So you're going to want to make sure that your closure and your shutdown plans are part of your COVID assessment plan. Um, 
reassessing your whole entire plan is something that you should be doing on a regular basis, but because of COVID, um, it should be expedient that you reassess your plan. Just reassess where you are. If your plan needs to be updated, um, absolutely be cognizant of what updates you should have in there. Um, communication, uh, communication is definitely a, a requirement just is just very important um, how you are communicating with that and that's just going to be part of your reassessment plan did one part of your communication work better with your employees than another um, these are things that you're going to have in your plan and reassess uh, what type of cleaning uh, company you use what type of cleaning and disinfectant policies and procedures that you have Sid did an excellent job at telling us the difference between just uh, cleaning and disinfecting. So what are you doing to make sure that the entity that you're using to clean your facilities, um, what are you doing to make sure that they are um, up to par for this post-COVID um, world we live in? Next slide. Okay, so we're gonna go into now a little bit about uh, Yellow Bird, and uh, Sid is going to follow up behind me, and uh, he's gonna talk a little bit about Open Works, but I just wanted to introduce Yellow Bird to you. And uh, we are a two-sided marketplace. Um, we're a two-sided two marketplace startup, and our goal is to match companies that have safety needs. Um, to professionals that are safety and health professionals, safety environmental and health professionals that are out there. So we are, we like to say we're a matchmaker between companies that need safety services and professionals out there who are very diverse in their safety aspects of, um, of what they're doing as far as their job. So our focus is on construction, um, manufacturing oil and gas, and we've matched pros from many, many different industries. Um, so that is what we do. Next slide. Sid, do you wanna talk about OpenWorks? I will. Thank you, Shirley. Um, so a little bit about OpenWorks. Okay. So um, we've been in business for 37 years. Um, we are a premier cleaning uh, company. And some of the uh, advantages of working with OpenWorks, OpenWorks, uh, our network of elite service providers, um, we bring together many different facets of the cleaning uh, process. Uh, we work with cleaning owner or company cleaning company owners that are dedicated to mutual success. Uh, we value uh, our partnership with our cleaning providers and uh, our company facilitates um, HVAC cleaning. We, we do, uh, as I listed, disinfecting. We do cleaning uh, in many different types of industries. We're well-versed in, in, in medical. We're well-versed in, in production, uh, office cleaning, clean rooms. Um, we are, we are kind of a one-stop shop. Um, you basically partner with us and, and you are able to, uh, you know, tap into all of the resources that we have at our disposal. Um, with our 98% uh, retention rate, which is 43% higher than the company average, or the country average, by the way, um, we are able to pull together kind of a, a suite of, of resources that would absolutely meet your needs. So. Uh, there's, here's, here's a, here's a shocker here. We use, uh, EPA approved infectants in our cleaning. Um, we're well versed at, uh, at combating COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2 and other bloodborne pathogens. We're certified, we're, uh, certified by the, uh, by OSHA. We're certified by, uh, the, the uh, Global Bio-Risk Advisory Council, um, we are, let's see, we are basically, as I mentioned before, a one-stop shop uh, care company. Uh, we have integrated facility services uh, to, for single source for all facility needs. 
Uh, we have single point of contact for communication, uh, local service with corporate oversight. That's basically kind of our motto here. And we have high quality and we're extraordinarily responsive. So, uh, and we basically specialize in making sure that you have a cleaner, healthier and safer environment. Um, that's kind of our, our mantra here. Um, let's see. Also, um, you know, with today's environment, I'd like to talk a little bit about kind of our suite of services that we have available. So OpenWorks, actually, uh, we have what's called uh, TotalWorks, which is our comprehensive suite of services. And it's developed um, at, in conjunction and in partnership and recommended by uh, agency experts from the CDC and EPA. Uh, and, and with feedback from our OpenWorks customers, uh, it's basically our system of cleaning and disinfecting and treating high touch services, workspaces, common areas, restrooms, and uh, it, you know, basically uh, hard to reach areas throughout your facility. Um, and those programs typically include um, our Sani services and our InfectiGuard services. And I'll talk a little bit about those. So our Sani services, uh, basically that is uh, our ongoing cleaning and disinfecting service and it offers um, three cleaning and disinfecting options, uh, covering workspaces and common areas and restrooms and high touch surfaces that I talked about earlier throughout your facility. And we also, of course, use list and approved um, disinfectants to do that. We also have InfectiGuard. Now InfectiGuard is kind of a one-time uh, deep cleaning and disinfecting service that gives you peace of mind that your facility has been disinfected uh, with those EPA approved um, uh, disinfectants. Uh, so if you, um, if you uh, are interested in, in stopping the spread or in mitigating the spread, uh, as I mentioned before, using those listed disinfectants are the only way to do that. So if you've actually had a confirmed case of COVID-19 in your facility or an outbreak, um, we are extremely well versed in going in and, and, and mitigating that virus. And we use what we call InfectiGuard, uh, which is, is a process that's recommended by the, the Global Bio Risk Advisory Council. It's a six step process that basically goes in and makes sure that we can reach all the areas that the virus could, could live or linger, uh, even hard to reach areas that typically don't get cleaned on a regular basis. Uh, our InfectiGuard process actually goes in and, and mitigates the virus there as well. Um, so just kind of, you know, a wrap up here, just kind of give you a quick summary of some of the things you picked up on today. Um, one of the things that you want to do, of course, is you want to assess the air quality of your facility, uh, create spatial mapping plan, you want to do that, uh, implement engineering controls, very important, um, conduct surface testing and ensure that there are no, there is COVID in your facility. Uh, you want to evaluate the cleaning and disinfecting plan that you currently have in place, and you want to have a maintenance plan and assessment protocol in place as well. Um, and then next slide. And that'll open it up to questions. Thanks, Sid and Shirley. Um, let me see what we've got as far as questions for you. Um, the, we re oops, sorry about that. We received, um, one that says is, it, as far as spatial mapping goes, is, is six feet the standard distance that you would recommend or, um, in an office, in a standard office environment? I'll take that question. This is Shirley. Um, the six feet is the guidelines that we've been given definitely by the CDC. And within an office area, um, those guidelines are not um, changed. Um, six feet is definitely the distance um, that, we've been, that we've been given um, to, to state um, what is an acceptable and lower risk uh, distancing between um, people. 
So yes, six feet, even though you're, you may be in an office area, uh, that is still applicable to um, how the uh, spread of COVID, COVID is. Shirley, what equipment would you recommend for testing airflow and um, CO and CO2 levels? Uh, yes, there, there are air um, monitors. And these air monitors um, basically can be um, uh, purchased or um, you can have a company such as Yellowbird come out and um, uh, test your air with the uh, equipment that our professionals have. But your equipment to, to test the air, you will want something that will actually have a flow level meter there. You want to make sure that your carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide levels are um, at an acceptable uh, level. You want to make sure that the equipment uh, can do humidity testing. So there's a variety of things that you can do as far as having that equipment. But um, Yellowbird, we do have professionals that can come in and do uh, your surface testing as well as your air testing for you with the equipment that we have. And Shirley, is surface and air testing a governmental requirement? Um, it's surface testing and air testing, uh, there's nothing that OSHA has stated that you have to do uh, as far as having that done. However, what they do say is providing a safe work environment safe and healthy work environment for your employees. Um, with air testing, you're testing the um, efficiency of your HVAC system. And with testing that HVAC system and its efficiency, um, that's one of the engineering controls that lowers the uh, exposure um, to COVID in the workplace. And it is intended to have good air quality. So, in a roundabout way, um, it's your due diligence to make sure as a corporation or an organization to make sure that you're um, providing a safe work environment. And your reassurance is making sure that those particular systems are working at their capacity and working at the manufacturer's designation. Great, thank you. Sid, do you recommend electrostatic cleaning? And if so, how often? Um, we do recommend electrostatic cleaning. Um, and for those of you who uh, are unfamiliar with that term or what that is, electrostatic cleaning is um, use of, um, it's a way to dispense a disinfectant electrostatically um, by means of a positive charge. <laughs> so it positively charges the disinfectant so that when it lands on a negatively charged surface like a table or a wall or a uh, keyboard, it will basically stick to it. Um, it will adhere to anything it touches. So it doesn't run, it doesn't drip, it can go underneath things, it can go into nooks and crannies. So it's an extremely thorough way of distributing uh, disinfectants. Um, in some cases, it's extremely uh, more effective than just kind of spraying it and letting it dwell and then wiping it. Uh, it gets into places that usually just spraying uh, something with a regular old spray bottle cannot uh, uh, so I do recommend that I recommend it highly <laughs> thank you Sid <laughs> um, along the same line Sid um, this is more something you could probably address with your expertise versus just a question but this gentleman says I've been hearing a lot about paints and protective coatings that offer long-term antimicrobial protection um, obviously we've been talking about that at open works do you want to share a little more um, insight on kind of how we're we're monitoring that within the industry sure, and what they sure. are. Absolutely. So, um, so just uh, not getting too far into the weeds on the science on this, but basically, uh, there are coatings uh, that are out there that can be applied to services, which um, once again kind of uses. Uh, electrostatic and what it does is if, if a, a virus it prevents viruses from being able to uh, replicate or grow so as soon as a virus lands on a treated surface it instantly kills it um, a way to wrap your head around it is just think about kind of like the properties of copper 
um, or doorknobs. Doorknobs are typically treated uh, with copper or um, uh, zinc. And what that does is uh, viruses can't, they, they can't live on it. Uh, as soon as it touches, it dies uh, almost immediately. So this basically is a way of coding a service to, to uh, be completely resistant to any um, uh, bacteria or viruses. We, um, OpenWorks as a company, uh, have partnered with uh, a company that actually specializes in this. And we had quite a, a few successes and a great deal of experience actually treating some surfaces um, and our customers are extremely happy with that. Uh, we are still collecting the data to, to you know to to be able to present to our general public but so far I can tell you that um, it's a relatively simple process and it does the science is there and it does seem to work so um, I hope that answers your question. Awesome. Thank you. Sid, if someone tests positive for COVID um, within the workplace, what should be the process? Should, should the company close down? What kind of deep cleaning should they do? Can you give them a general recommendation? Sure, sure, absolutely. So the first thing you want to do is you want to assess the risk. Um, there are a lot of cases where someone has tested positive within a particular uh, business or a particular building, and uh, you want to you want to assess the exposure to other employees. So if this person kind of works alone in a cubicle by themselves and doesn't really go anywhere, um, then the risk is relatively low. Uh, for uh, contamination of other employees, you'd still want to uh, bring in a company to to completely thoroughly disinfect the area that this person frequented. You would want to assess that risk to make sure that you um, you would whether or not you needed to enact a shutdown plan. Um, a lot of times. Uh, the, the risk is so small that this person has had six feet minimal contact. We've had, we've had uh, good um, social distancing practices and, and, and mask wearing in place at these locations that you, that you don't have to, um, that you don't actually have to worry about the, the uh, risk of contamination to other people. But let's just say there, there was, you know, this was a, 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 a giant office full of cubicles and, and this particular person has come in contact with many people and there wasn't great social distancing practice, then absolutely the first thing you would want to do is you would need to shut down that facility. You would need to immediately bring in a company uh, to come in and mitigate the virus. Uh, you probably would want to make sure that that company or you would partner with a company that could go in and and treat VAC as well, because this being a, uh, as we're, we're instructed not to call it an airborne virus now, we're, we're still, uh, it's, it's, it's droplets, and those droplets can linger in the air for a period of time, so you, you'd want to look at having a fogger or something that could, that could go in and actually treat the air, air scrubbers, you'd want to have the, the, um, the filters changed, you'd want to make sure that you uh, had the, the HVAC cleaned, and um, and any other surface that this person came in, in contact with. So once again, it really depends on the level of exposure and your, your step one assessment plan as to what you would enact after that. Thank you. Um, Shirley, how often do you recommend that the air levels are tested in an office space? Um, that's going to be determined by uh, many different um, aspects of your workplace, um, your air quality testing uh, should be on your regular maintenance schedule, and that is depending upon your HVAC unit itself. Um, some require maintenance quarterly, some require maintenance six, every six months, and some annually. Um, however, testing post-COVID, I would recommend um, that your air quality is actually tested often. And what I mean by often is at least, I would say uh, monthly, you should check your air quality as far as the maintenance of your system. But your air quality as far as regular air and breathing, you can have that checked as often as you feel uh, necessary. Um, as often as you feel that your employees will be um, uh, satisfied at what you're doing and putting in place with them. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Um, let's see, I think we have time for one more question. Sid, um, is there any kind of disinfection process that's uh, recommended for porous surfaces like fabric, carpets, upholstery, that kind of thing? Absolutely. Um, that is best treated with a fogger or an electrostatic process. Once again, you need something that's capable of getting into, um, you know, the, the, the nooks and crannies. You'd need something that has a, uh, you know, something that has microns that can actually go inside these fabrics. Using just kind of a spray bottle and, and kind of dousing it over uh, would treat the surface, but it doesn't actually get into the, the, the porous fibers. But electrostatic and fogging actually has the, the, the microns that can actually get in there and get to those uh, areas. Area uh, of, the, of that porous surface. So, if you were treating something like that, I definitely recommend. Um, I mean, you can you can use basically a fogger. They're relatively inexpensive. Uh, you can use any uh, EPA listed approved disinfectant in the fogger. It's just the the way of dispensing it. You basically just treat that surface uh, by spraying the or having the fogger aim directly at it. It goes in there and kills anything it touches. Fantastic. Thank you. I think that addressed some, of, some more of the questions that we had in our Q&A portion. And I'll share with the audience, too, that um, if for questions that we haven't addressed today, we have a Q&A document, uh, an FAQ document that I'd be happy to send um, everybody via email over the next uh, probably Monday. So you might want to keep an eye out for that. And if you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to contact us at OpenWorks or at Yellowbird, their contact information is on the screen right now. We really appreciate everybody's attendance today. And with that, we wish you a fantastic weekend. Great, and this is just Amy Brown with Facilities Net thanking once again OpenWorks and Yellowbird and Shirley and Sid and Shauna for helping uh, present this information today. It was a great webcast. Just a reminder for our audience, you will receive an email from us after the event finishes here today with a link to the archive uh, as well as the presentation and the CEUs uh, for today's webcast if you need to earn CEUs for your participation today. So thank you again and hope everyone has a wonderful weekend.